Hi, my name is Sebastian Matteau and welcome to this Open Sesame video tutorial. In this uh, video today, I'm going to show you how you can create a complete psychology experiment using the software Open Sesame. Now, Open Sesame is a free and open source uh, program for creating psychology experiments, such as the one we're going to create today, or neuroscience experiments, or experiments in the field of behavioral economics, experimental economics. Essentially, any kind of uh, experiment that involves a participant who sits behind a computer and performs some kind of computerized task, while you, as the researcher, collect the responses of that participant or the brain signals of that participant or perhaps the eye movements or the verbal response, the responses of that participant. Essentially any kind of measurement that you as a researcher are interested in. Now, uh, such experiments can be quite complicated to create and Open Sesame is a program that makes this as easy as possible. So it's a very user-friendly graphical environment that allows you to create these kinds of uh, complicated behavioral experiments. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at the software itself. If we want to work with Open Sesame, the first thing uh, that you need to do, of course, if you haven't done so already, is download the software, which you can do for free. So, uh, to download Open Sesame, you can visit osdoc.coxi.nl. Then you get uh, to the documentation side. And on the documentation side, you will find a clear link, download. Click on it. And then on the download page, the website will make a suggestion which kind of installation uh, package or installer uh, program is uh, most suitable for your system. So in this case, it suggests that I use the Windows installer because I'm actually on Windows 7 for this uh, screencast. Uh, now, what we're going to do today is follow this tutorial, the beginner tutorial. And I will actually have this tutorial open next to me. You can see that, but I have it open on my, uh, on my tablet. And I will walk with you through each of the steps for this uh, beginner tutorial. Yes, you'll have to pardon the speed of my internet connection. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> so we will go through each of these 13 steps uh, and in the process create a complete psychological experiment. Now, what kind of experiment are we going to create? We are going to create a so-called gaze cueing experiment, which is a pretty cool, uh, very simple uh, experiment. Uh, and here you see a graphical depiction of what a trial in a gaze cueing experiment looks like. So the experiment that we're going to create, just to, to, uh, to be very clear about that, is a trial-based experiment, right, of the type that we often do in experimental psychology, in which we repeat a single kind of very simple procedure over and over again, manipulating uh, small things in the process. So it's a trial-based exper experiment, not a questionnaire or anything like that. And in our case, a trial starts with a fixation dot in the center of the screen, uh, and this fixation dot is simply there for participants uh, so because participants are supposed to look at it. Then the fixation dot is followed by a smiley and the smiley looks right at us. And that is the gaze, the gaze stimulus. Then after a little while, the smiley looks either to the left or to the right. Now, the crucial, a crucial point for this experiment is that the direction of the smiley is completely irrelevant for the participant. There's no relationship between the task that the participant has to do and the direction in which the smiley is looking. But nevertheless, because gaze is such a strong social cue, uh, we tend to pay attention to what the smiley is looking at, right? So if the smiley looks at the left, we tend to pay attention to the left side of the screen automatically, whereas if the smiley would have been looking at the right side of the screen, we would have shifted our attention to the right, because we simply cannot ignore, essentially, the direction that it, someone else is looking at. Now, so this is the gaze cue. Then the gaze cue is followed, or rather he is uh, joined by a target stimulus. And the target is a letter F or a letter H. And the task that the participant has to perform is say whether there is an F or an H. There's always either an F or an H. Never no F and no H and never both. On the other side of the screen, there's an X. That's the distractor. So there's always a distracting stimulus and that's an X. Now you see that in this case, the, 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 the smiley actually looks in the direction of the target. And because we tend to follow the direction of gaze, we are fast in these kinds of trials because our attention is already here at the right location when the target appears. Compared to when the smiley had been looking in the other direction and then our attention would have been here and we would have had sort of shift our attention back to the target location in order to uh, see whether there's an F or an H. So we expect that people, just to, the prediction is very simply, we expect that participants are more accurate and faster when the smiley looks at the target than when the smiley looks in the other direction. Uh, and then we collect, using a keyboard response, we collect the 
identification of the target. So the participant presses a Z, uh, a Z if there is an F and an M if there is a if there is an H. Uh, simply because at least on a QWERTY keyboard, the Z and the M are kind of conveniently located uh, on the left and right side of the keyboard. And then there is a sampler, a sound that is played, but this sound is only played if the participant responds incorrectly. Okay, and that's the entire trial sequence. So that's what we're going to work towards. Now, let's switch to Open Sesame. So if you start Open Sesame for the first time, you will see something like this. The, thing, the, the tab that opens is a welcome tab for new users. Uh, it actually points you in the direction of the step-by-step -step tutorial that we're going to do now. It invites you to see some new things in Open Sesame 3, uh, points you towards the forum where you can ask questions, but we are not that interested, so I say dismiss this message forever. Now then there's another tab that you normally see, even if you're not a new user, that you normally see if you start Open Sesame, and that's a, a, a Get Started tab. So it, it invites you to start to either continue a recent experiment, so I was already recently working on this gaze queuing tutorial, or to start a new experiment with one of the templates. Now, the, the templates, the default template is what is loaded here already. So we're go actually going to use that for our, uh, for our tutorial. But just to give you some idea, the extended template already provides the basic structure of a typical trial-based experiment with a practice phase and an experimental phase. Um, so that would actually be a good template to start from for us for this experiment. But just because I want to show how you can build the entire structure yourself, we're going to start with the default template. Then there's a questionnaire template that is good if you want to uh, do a questionnaire, an Android template if you want to make a, a tablet-based experiment on Android, and an eye tracking template if you want to do some basic eye tracking. Now, so as I said, we're just going to continue using the default template. Okay, now, then we start now at step one of the experiment in which we're going to create the main sequence. But I think before we actually start, just to take one step back, I should explain uh, tell you a little bit about the user interface of Open Sesame. So what we have here at the very top is the menu bar, right? Just like most applications have. And the menu bar just has very standard options like opening and saving files, uh, undoing things, some things, to some viewing options, etc. Of course, a help menu that actually provides you provides access to the entire documentation site from within Open Sesame. Um, then below the menu bar, we have what we call the main toolbar. The main toolbar is essentially just a selection with the most relevant items from the uh, from the menu bar, the things that you would need that you would use most. Right? Again, opening and saving, running the experiment, showing and hiding some elements from the user interface. And here's a very interesting button. I'm going to highlight it just for a second. That is the uh, the OSF login button. So the Op o Open Sesame integrates with the Open Science Framework. And I'm not actually going to do that here, but if you click on login, you will see that it opens the login portal, portal of the Open Science Framework and allows you to synchronize all your experiments and your data with the Open Science Framework. Uh, so I would invite you to look into that if you're interested in, uh, in that, but we're not going to bother with that for now. Okay, then we have here on the very left side, we have the item toolbar. The item toolbar basically gives you all the possible building blocks for your experiment. And what can you do with those building blocks, with those items? Well, you can drag them into your experiment, into the overview area that you see here. So the overview area gives you a graphical depiction of the structure of your experiment. And you see that every icon that you have in this overview area, that is one item. And the structure of your experiment is just determined by how, how all these items are stacked together and how they are connected. Now, and if you want to change the structure of your experiment, for example, add a new item, you can just pick it up from the item toolbar and drag it to the correct location in your, uh, in your experiment. So it's a very easy graphical drag and drop way, right? So here in the overview area, you will always kind of see a depiction of the structure of your experiment. Then here on the, on the right side, we have the general properties tab. Um, what does the general properties tab or the, the general properties tab do? Well, it's what you get if you click on the, the top level thing here, in this case called new experiment, and it provides a few options for general options for your experiment. Um, 
I think we're going to change a few things already just because it's convenient later on. Uh, right now you see that the backend is experiment, which is quite a good backend, provides very precise timing of visual stimuli. But because right now if I'm doing it while recording a screencast and in a virtual machine it's a bit slow, I'm going to select the legacy backend, which is a bit simpler, but a bit faster and better for this purpose. Um, then you see the foreground color. Um, right now it is white on black, so white foreground and a black background. The stimuli that we're going to use actually have a white background and a black foreground, so it makes sense to reverse this, right? So we're going to do that already. We say, okay, our foreground is black and our background is white. You see that our default font is a mono space of 18 pixels. That is kind of small, so we, let's make it a little bit bigger, say that it's 24 pixels. Um, and finally, when we're going to run the experiment, uh, I want to show it uh, with some things by things on the side. And because right now the resolution occupies most of the most of the display, I'm actually going to make it a little bit smaller. So make the resolution 640 by 480, for example. I'm just doing that so that I can run the experiment and show you some other things at the same time. Okay, more generally. This tab area, so this region right here, shows you whatever kind of tabs you open. It's kind of like a web browser. For example, if I click on the getting started item, it opens a tab with the text of this notepad. If I click on the welcome sketchpad, it opens a tab with the information from this uh, welcome sketchpad. Right, so this is kind of like a web browser that allows you to view all kinds of things. Also, for example, if I would open the, the documentation or the blog, for example, uh, it would actually open a web browser here in Open Sesame. Yeah, that was an interesting blog post that I wrote a while back about emoticons and uh, how we tend to use more and more of them. Um, okay, so. So far for the basics of the Open Sesame user interface, so let's now really move on to uh, step one of the tutorial. So what we're going to do in step one of the tutorial is create the structure of our experiment at the highest level. So at the highest level, I mean really the, the level that uh, determines the, like that we first have an instruction screen, then a practice phase, then a message to say that the practice phase has ended, then an experimental screen, and then an, a message to thank the participant for participating, right? So really, really the highest level, and we're not going to bother yet with the details of the trial sequence. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is remove these two items that all, are already in our experiment uh, sequence because we don't really need them. So I click, delete, click. You can also just press the delete key up. And you see they move to the unused item bin, items bin. So there's kind of like a trash, uh, like a trash can. And if you want, you can also restore items from the unused items bin, like drag it back to the, the experiment, right? Um, so you don't lose them if you accidentally delete them. I think, always think it looks a bit messy if you have a lot of things in the unused item, items bin. So I'm going to delete it. Up, clear it up. Up. Now, and now we're going to create the basic structure. So the highest structure of our experiment as explained in step one of the tutorial. Um, and it works as follows. We first have a instruction screen. So what I do is I pick up this item, a form text display, that is just a, uh, yeah, just a form to display text. So it's perfectly fine to present uh, instructions. There are multiple ways to present instructions in Open Sesame, but a form text display is one of them. Um, you see that by default, the item has a name like new underscore form text display. Um, don't leave the names like that, right? Because then you get the you get very messy, uh, you get very messy, uh, messy experiments. So I always rename them. To, so that the names make sense, I say, okay, instructions. This item is the instructions item. Okay, then I pick up another item and I drag it after the instructions. It's a loop item. I drag it up and I drop it. Now, what does the loop item do? It runs another item multiple times. In our case, this item, I will call it the practice loop, is going to run one or more practice blocks. Right now, you see here in the run, it says there is no item selected. So we need to add an item kind of as a daughter of the practice loop. What we're going to do is pick up a sequence. It's this icon right here. 
and I'm going to drop it onto the practice loop and bop, drop it. And then it will ask me, do I want to insert it into the practice loop or after? If I, if I select insert into, you will see that this new sequence becomes a daughter of the practice loop. And I call it block sequence. Because this block, we're going to leave this block empty for now, but it will correspond to a single block of trials. So what this basically means is that this practice loop allows us to run this single block of trials multiple times, uh, one or more times, and that is going to be, be the practice phase of our experiment. Now, after the, after the practice phase is finished, which we are not going to fill in further for the moment, we're going to give another message to the participant. We're going to use another form text display. I drag it onto the practice loop. Now it asks me if I want to insert it into the practice loop or insert it after the practice loop. If I would insert it into the practice loop, it would repl replace the block sequence. So that's definitely what, not what I want to do. I want to insert it after the practice loop so that it comes at the same level, right? At the same level of the hierarchy, but then later. And I will call this the end of practice. Uh, now, after the practice phase is finished and we've told the participant that, that it's finished, we want to have more blocks, this time corresponding to the experimental part of our experiment, right? So the practice part would be that we give the participant some time to practice, usually one block, maybe two blocks, and then we start with the proper experiment. So I'll pick up another a loop item, drag it after the end of practice message, drop it, and I will call it just by convention, experimental loop. Now, just like the practice loop needs a, uh, something to run, the experimental loop also needs something to run. So we could insert a new sequence into the experimental loop. That would be fine in principle. But because in our case, the practice phase and the experimental phase are identical, right? The only thing that's different is that we're going to throw the practice trials away and the experimental trials not. Uh, we can actually reuse this block sequence. So what you can do here under run is click and just select an existing item block sequence. Oh, there we go. And now you see that basically block sequence occurs here as daughter of practice loop, but also here as daughter of experimental loop. And it's really the same sequence. So everything that we change in the, in the block sequence of the practice loop will also change in the block sequence of the experimental loop. And that's exactly what we want. This is called what is called an open sesame, a linked copy. And that's exactly what we want because it avoids us from having to do the same thing multiple times, right? Now, and then when the experimental loop is over, again, we're not going to fill in the details just yet. We're just going to assume that when the experimental loop is over, uh, we want to thank the participant for, for his or her participation. And we're going to use another form text display for that. So I pick it up, drag it here, drop, insert after experimental loop, right? Because otherwise it would replace the block sequence. And I call it end of experiment. Okay, now, so that is, that is essentially, we now have the, the highest, the top level structure of our experiment is now in place. Uh, you see that the experiment is still called new experiment. That's a little bit, that's not that nice. So I click on it, I rename it, and uh, I call it tutorial, up gaze queuing. Okay, you also see that now, right now we have a lot of tabs open. Uh, that can be a little bit annoying because it is confusing, right? There's a lot of information there. Also, for example, on Mac OS, this can be extra annoying because the, if there are a lot of tabs open, it tends to kind of increase the size of the window and so that it doesn't fit on the display anymore. It's kind of a funky, uh, funky artifact of the user interface. Uh, so what you can do is if you, just to clean things up, you can say view, uh, close other tabs. Up. Then all tabs except for the one that's currently open are closed. What you can also do and what I personally usually do is enable one tab mode by clicking here. Then the whole tab bar disappears and you just always have one tab open at a time, right? So if you switch to another tab, the, the old tab is closed uh, uh, automatically. Now, now it's also important to save your experiment, right? Because if we make a mistake or if the computer crashes or whatever, when disaster strikes, I say save. I do it in the downloads folder, why not? Tutorial gaze queuing, save, up. 
Okay, and that officially brings us to the end of step one. So what we've done here, just to recap, we've made our experiment sequence such that we start with instructions, then one or more uh, practice blocks, followed by a message to, thank the, to say to the participant that the practice phase is over, followed by one or more experimental blocks, followed by uh, a message to say the tell to the participant that the experiment is finished. Now, in step two, and you can uh, you can read along with me if you open the, the, the tutorial on the on the website, uh, we're going to create the block sequence. So we're going to, to fill in this block sequence right here. Now, right now the block sequence is open, uh, is, 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 is empty. So what does the block sequence need to do? What, what does one block sequence look like? Well, uh, it starts with a block of trials and that block of trials, um, it's it, it, just to start, basically the block sequence will be a block of trials followed by feedback on the performance of that block of trials. And we can do that as follows. That block of trials is going to be another loop. So I pick it up and I drag it into the block sequence. I say insert into block sequence. This I call by convention, the block loop. The block loop will run one or more sequences and that sequence corresponds to a single trial, right? This may sound a bit cryptic, but I will just bear with me and it will, this, the logic will become clear. So what I do, I pack and pick up another sequence and I drag it into the block loop, drop it, insert into block loop. I call it trial sequence. Now, later for now we'll leave the trial sequence empty, but later in the tutorial we'll fill it in. So the trial sequence will correspond to one single trial. This block loop that runs the trial sequence one or more times corresponds to a block of trials. And then after this block of trials, we're going to pick up this item, which is called the feedback item. Insert after block loop, feedback. Such that we have a block of trials followed by feedback on the performance of that block of trials. And that's what goes into the block sequence. Now, we ideally also do one other thing. Before the block of trials, we pick up this item, which is called the reset feedback item. And we up, insert into block sequence. You see that I rename the, the items immediately if I add them to the experiment. It's just good style to do so. And the reason for this reset feedback item is to avoid carryover effects from uh, block to block in the feedback. So imagine that we've collected already responses here before. Um, then they would be carried on. They would be uh, taken into account in the feedback that we want to give after the block of trials. So to avoid that, which would actually not happen in this particular case, but in general to avoid that, we explicitly reset all the feedback variables before we before each block of trials, so that when we give feedback after each block of trials, um, we only take into account that one block of trials. Okay, that is uh, essentially the logic of our experiment. It is a bit uh, understanding the structure, the hierarchy with these blocks and uh, blocks, and loops and sequences, is one of the more tricky things to do in Open Sesame. So. I think we should take a moment to go through how this particular structure works. What we have is at the bottom, at the lowest level of our hierarchy, we have a trial sequence, which is empty for now, but we'll fill it in later. This trial sequence corresponds or will correspond to a single trial, just one trial, right? So this trial sequence will be essentially what we've depicted here. That's our trial sequence that will become our trial sequence. The block loop, one level above runs this trial sequence one or more times so that we have a block of trials, but not followed by feedback yet. The block sequence runs this one block of trials and has it followed by feedback. That's why it's a block sequence. And the block sequence in turn is part of the practice loop or the experimental loop, right? Because they're the same structurally. And the practice loop and the experimental loop run the block sequence one or more times. So they run one or more times a, a block of trials followed by feedback. So really the structure is quite simple uh, once you understand the logic of how these loops and these sequences are chained together. 
Okay, that's the end of, uh, of uh, step two. So let's move on to step three. And in step three, we're going to do, uh, we're going to define our independent variables and we're going to do this in the block loop. So if I click on the block loop, you see that we have a table. Now the idea of this table is that uh, we can define our independent variables here. I'll just make a dummy variable. I'll call it, I don't know, uh, condition. And then I say A and B. Now, what this means is that we will run the trial sequence two times, once while the variable condition has the value A and once while the variable condition has the value B. That's all it means. So it's a very simple, simple way to define your variables. If we want to have another condition, a2 and mb2, uh, we just add them in the, in the, in the columns, uh, in the other columns, right? So we can define a lot of experimental variables here. Say that we want to repeat all these conditions more times, we can have this repeat value and we can say, okay, repeat everything twice. And then you actually get a summary here. It says trial sequence will be called four times in random order. The number of rows is two, right? Because we have two rows. All rows occur twice because our repeat value is two, right? So that's a very simple logic really. Now, in our case, we have a few variables. The, we have the most important ones. Most important ones are the, the direction of the gaze cue to the left or the right, and the position of the target to the left or the right, and also the, or, the identity of the target. So whether it's an F or an H. Now, in all conditions, all these, all these Factors are going, going, going to uh, occur in all possible combinations, right? We're going to have like left, 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 right, right, left, and right, right, etc. So it's a full factorial design, in other words. We could enter this all the all these possible combinations manually here in this in this table, and actually there are only eight, so it's not even that much work. But uh, a smarter way to do it is using this full factorial design wizard here. So I'm going to click on that. And ah, the data is already there. Uh, so how the full factorial design wizard works is that on the first row, you enter the name of your variables. So in our case, we have gaze Q and gaze Q has the value left or right, right? Because the, the, the smiley either looks to the left or to the right. Then we have the target position. And here we've specified essentially also left and right, but now we have actually specified the location of the target on the display because that's going to be easier for us later on. And what we've basically the display zero, zero comma zero. So the coordinate zero, zero is the center of the screen. Negative X values are to the left. So minus 300 would mean 300 pixels to the left of the center. And 300 means 300 pixels to the right of the center. And coding it like this, this is in our case a little bit easier than just using left and right coding as we did for gaze Q. You will see later on why that is the case, right? But it means the same thing, left and right. And then we have our target letter and the target letter has the identity F or H. Uh, now, if I click on OK, you will see that Open Sesame automatically makes all possible combinations of these three factors, right? So this is a two by two by two design. So we should end up with eight rows. And that's actually what happens, right? So here you see uh, here you see our nice uh, nice uh, nice uh, table with independent variables. Now we need to do a few more things. You see that we have defined the position of the target, but we have not defined the position of the distractor yet. In principle, that's redundant because the distractor is obviously the target uh, uh, times minus one. Huh? Because if the target is 300 pixels to the left of the center, then the distractor is 300 pixels to the right of the center. But because this is a beginner tutorial, we're going to be take the easy way out and we're explicitly going to code the location of the distractor. So whenever the target is minus 300, the distractor is 300. Oh. And the other way around. Oh. Do copy pasting, right? So we're just going to minus 300, 300, etc. Now we're going to add another final uh, variable, namely correct response. And again, this variable is strictly speaking redundant because we know that if the target is F, the participant has to press the Z key. But to make life easier for us, we're going to explicitly encode the correct response as well. 
right? So whenever the target is an F, the correct response is a Z because participant presses the Z in response to an F. And whenever the target letter is an H, we, the correct response is an M. Okay, so that's it. Uh, if you do this kind of redundant coding, as I'm doing here, right, because this pos is redundant with target pos, and correct response is redundant with target letter, you always have a risk of making mistakes, right? For example, say that I accidentally did this, then just because I made a typo, then on this particular trial, uh, the correct response would have actually been be, be counted as incorrect. And uh, those kinds of bugs do happen, so be very careful. Right, but here I think uh, I'm pretty sure I did it correctly. Okay, uh, that's it. That's what we had to do here in the in step three, define our independent variables. Now in step four, we're actually going to use other files, right? We need external files in this experiment because our smiley is actually an image and the sound file that we're going to play, play back when there's an error is a sound file. Now, Open Sesame allows you to bundle files with your experiment by putting them in file pool. So if you click on this, this kind of folder icon, you open the file pool, you see you, you, you show the file pool. Uh, and the file pool, all the files that you put there, it's like a folder, but all the files that you put there are saved along or inside your experiment file. So that's very nice because it means that if you, for example, send your experiment to a colleague, you don't have to send the experiment script and all kinds of extra files, but you can just send the experiment file and all the images and sounds will be bundled inside that uh, experiment file. Now, what, which file, what kind of files do we add, need to add to the file pool? Now, for that, I'm going to go to the, to the website, to the tutorial. Here you see uh, we're actually in step four, add images and sound files to the file pool. So here you see the four images, the four, three images and the sound file that we need. So I'm just going to save them, save as, up, save as, up, save as. Okay, now once I've downloaded them, I can go back to Open Sesame, and then you can, adding files to the file pool is really easy. You can just pick them up and up, drag them in there, and there they are. Now they've been copied into the file pool, and when I save my experiment, these four files will be bundled along with my experiment. So that's very easy, right? If I click on this button, it opens the location of the file pool in the file manager, and you see that the file pool has, be, has this kind of weird location. It's kind of a temporary folder somewhere in your operating system. Uh, so that, that is just because nor Open Sesame needs to extract these files somewhere because they're bundled inside the experiment and it creates some kind of temporary folder uh, to do so. So don't wonder where the file pool is. It's just in some kind of magical temporary folder. Okay, that brings us to the end of step four already. And now we're going to step five in which we are going to fill the trial sequence. So we're going to further define the trial sequence. So I'll hide the file pool. So the trial sequence, as I already said a few times, is a single trial of our experiment. And so far we've left it empty, right? So what should a single trial look like? I'll go back to the picture. A single trial starts with a fixation dot, then a smiley face in the center. Well, it's not really even smiling, is it? It's kind of like a sterny face. Then a sterny face that looks either to the left or to the right. And then that same sterny face looking to the left or to the right with the target on one side and the distractor on another side. Then a keyboard response to collect the participant's uh, key press. Then only if the participant responds incorrectly, a sound file. And finally, and that's important and not visualized here in this picture, we need to log the data using a so-called logger item. Open Sesame doesn't automatically log data. You need to explicitly do that with a logger item. So switching back to Open Sesame, we have four stimulus displays. Stimulus displays are usually, not always, but usually presented using this item, the sketchpad. So we're going to pick up the one sketchpad and we're just going to add four sketchpads to our trial sequence. Up. And I'm going to rename them uh, F2. F2 is the shortcut for renaming. Fixation dot. 
after the fixation dot, there's the, uh, what's it called? Neutral gaze. After the neutral gaze, there's the gaze cue, right? So the neutral gaze is the image where the smiley looks right ahead and the gaze cue is the image where the smiley looks to the side. And then the target, and the target is the display that also includes the gaze cue, but also the target and the distractor. So we're not going to further fill in these four sketch pads right now, we're just going to put them here. And then we need to collect the keyboard response. To do that, we use this keyboard response item. So I pick it up, up, and drop it. And then I rename it to keyboard response, right? I remove the new because I think it's not a nice name. Then after we've collected the keyboard response, we need to, on, on incorrect trials, play a sound. Now, so sound playback is done usually with this sampler item. Pick it up and drop it after the keyboard response. And I rename it to incorrect sound. Hmm. And then as the very last thing in the experiment, as I said, we need to log the data. And for that, we're going to use this logger item, pick it up and I save it and I drop it. Okay, and I rename it just to logger. Now, uh, if I click on trial sequence, you see the same trial sequence here also shown here, but you see an extra column called run if. And this is a very useful column because it allows us to specify conditions under which uh, items are or are not shown. You see right now all items are always executed, uh, which is fine for every item except the incorrect sound, right? Because we want to uh, uh, play the incorrect sound item only when the participant makes a mistake. And we do that as follows. So we do that by putting the name of the correct var variable which I should say is a variable that OpenSesame keeps track of automatically. If you specify whether what the correct response is, and we've done that, right? We here in a block loop, we've specified on for every trial what the correct response is. If you do that, then OpenSesame will automatically create a variable called correct with the variable value zero if it was incorrect and a value one if it was correct. Now you see that I put square brackets behind, uh, uh, that I put the name of the variable between square brackets. That's the open sesame style of telling open sesame that this is the name of a variable, right? So we're not literally comparing the word correct to the value zero. No, we're comparing the variable correct to the value zero. And if it is zero, then we're going to play the incorrect sound. Otherwise we're going to ignore the incorrect sound. So these run if statements are very powerful ways to, to kind of control the flow of your experiment in a pretty simple way. Now that's it. We're already progressing nicely. That was the end of step five. Now we're going to step six, where we're going to draw the sketchpad item. So now we're going to really implement the visualization of our experiment, right? Because we've added four sketchpad items, these, but they're all empty for the moment. So let's start with the fixation dot because that's the easiest one. Now the fixation dot is very simple. It is just a fixation dot and we have a special element for that, the fixed dot element. So I'll click on it and then on center up and there we have it, a fixation dot. You see that if I move around, that you can, you can see these coordinates change, right? And zero, zero is the center, to the left is negative, to the right is positive for the X coordinate, up is negative for the Y coordinate and down is positive for the X coordinate. Uh, not all programming language use that, use that reference frame, but op for OpenSesame, that's the way it is. Now, then you see, in principle, the, that's all we need to add visually, but you also see that there's a duration field, which right now is key press, which means that the fixation dot will be shown for as long as possible, uh, for until the participant presses a key. Now, that's not what we want. We want to present the fixation dot for 750 milliseconds which is a nice value well, for a nice duration for a fixation dot. Now, say that I just type 750 milliseconds. That's in principle fine, but we run a risk of the, uh, of the, the, the software skipping one frame. The reason is that 750, uh, how should I phrase the, the reason is that if you specify a duration that's slightly shorter, than what you actually want, 
say 745. You give the computer a bit of time to breathe, you could say between frames, right? You don't have to worry about the fixation dot actually being shown for 745 milliseconds because your computer or your display periodically refreshes. So these interstimulus intervals necessarily have to match these uh, periodic refreshes of your computer monitor. And most computer monitors refresh 60 times per second. Um, but by specifying a slightly smaller value, say five milliseconds less than the actual duration that you want, you, you prevent timing glitches in general. This is kind of a technical point that's explained in a bit more detail on the documentation. Uh, but uh, just as a, as, a, as a guideline, say, okay, if I want to have, say, 1,000 milliseconds, I specify 995. And if I want 750, I specify 745, right? Just as a rule of thumb. Okay, that's it. The fixation dot is done. Then we move to the neutral gaze stimulus. So that's the one, the, the smiley that looks at you. So we're going to use, this is an image, right? So we're going to use the image element. I click on the center because I want it in the center. Uh, and then if I click on the center, it opens the file pool and I can select the gaze neutral stimulus. And I select it like this. Uh, and then you see the duration. Again, we have to, so the visually we're done now because that's all we need to do for the neutral gaze sketchpad. And for the duration, we have the same thing. We put the duration to 745 so that we get 750 milliseconds, right? Round it up. Okay, then we go to where it actually gets interesting, namely the gaze cue. So if I click here on the gaze cue, uh, let's first let's first do what we did before. Say that we want to that we are in a trial where the gaze where the gaze the smiley looks to the left, and I click on the center. I select gaze left. We wanted to uh, have a duration of 500 milliseconds for the gaze cue, so I put it to 495, right? 500 milliseconds minus 5 milliseconds. And then we're essentially done. But this is, of course, only valid for the trials in which gaze left uh, had the variable, uh, had the value, oh, sorry, in which the variable gaze Q had the value left, right? Where the smiley looks to the left. So how can we have the smiley depend on our gaze Q variable that we defined here, which is sometimes left and sometimes right? Well, we can do that by slightly modifying the script of this uh, of the sketchpad and it works as follows every every item even though you don't normally see it in open sesame but every item has a script hiding behind it in the background and you can see that script by clicking on this icon and saying view script or split view and then you see both and here we have our script so it's a very simple script right set duration 495 corresponding to this set description display stimuli corresponding to this and then one line that corresponds to the the smiley face now, and then what we're going to do here, it specifies file is gaze left.png. So it's always going to show gaze left.png. What we're going to do is replace the, ver the word left by gaze q between square brackets. Now, and you recognize this probably from what we did with, uh, the, with the run if statement, right? With correct is, is zero. So by putting square brackets around gaze q, we tell Open Sesame that gaze q is actually a variable. And then what we want to do is show the file that has gaze underscore, then the value of gaze Q, which can be left or right, dot PNG, right? So if gaze Q is left, then we're going to show gaze, gaze left dot PNG. And if gaze Q is right, we're going to show gaze right dot PNG. So that's a very simple, very elegant way uh, to have uh, kind of which image you actually going to show on a particular trial depend on a variable. Uh, you see that Open Sesame has replaced the, the smiley by a question mark because it cannot, like, it doesn't know which image is actually going to be shown, right? It just knows that something is going to be shown and indicates that by a question mark. So I say apply and close, and we're done with the gaze queue. Moving on to the target. Well, the target is similar in many ways to the gaze queue in the sense that we have the, the gaze queue is still there, right? So let's start by just adding the gaze queue like we did before. Image, click in the center, select gaze left, select. And then we're going to add, say, split view. I'm just doing exactly the same thing as I did before. And I replace this by gaze Q. And up, the smiley disappears and we get our question mark. But we also, of course, want to present the target letter and the distractor letter, right? So for that, we're going to use the 
the text line tool. So I click click on it, and then say here uh, to 200 uh, three here for example. Up, I going to enter text, and what I do is I enter target letter between square brackets, indicating that the target letter should be uh, that we we don't actually want to print out this literal text, but we want to print out, show on the screen the value of the variable target letter. And I say, okay. On the other side of the screen, I do the same thing. I, uh, but now an X because, and this is not the name of a variable, that's literally an X, right? Because the distractor is an X. Now you see that we have our target letter here, which will become an F or an H, depending on the value of the variable target letter. And on the other side, we have an X. That's, we're already making good progress, but obviously on some trials, the target letter is on the other side of the screen and the X is on the left. So we again need to change the script a little bit. So here we have our target, the line that corresponds to the target letter, right? Draw text line, blah, 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 target letter. And you see that the X coordinate has a fixed value of minus 288. And what we do is we essentially use the same trick again. We replace this fixed value by the variable target pos, indicating that this is a variable by putting it between square brackets. Up, there we go. Now it doesn't know where to position the target letter, so it puts it in the center by default. And for the distractor, which is corresponds to these two lines, right? Another text line with the text X, we do the same thing. But now it is not target pos, but dist pos, right? The distractor position. And again, it moves the X to the center in this visualization because it doesn't know where the X will be shown during the actual experiment. Now we're almost done. Uh, the only thing that we need to change is the duration, which right now is key press. Now it might make sense at first sight to leave this duration at key press because of course we want to collect the keyboard response to the target, right? But that's actually not correct because what we want to do is move on. We want to do essentially present this target display, and then move on immediately to the next item, the keyboard response. And to do that, we put the duration at zero. That doesn't mean that the display is only shown for zero milliseconds. It means that the display is shown and then zero milliseconds later, so without any delay, OpenSesame moves on to the next item, which is a keyboard response that collects the actual key press. And because the keyboard response doesn't replace what's on the display, the target will still be shown, right? So that's slightly counterintuitive maybe, but that's the logic of putting the duration to zero. Okay, now we have uh, completed step six, I believe this was step six, yes. And that was actually the hardest part of the whole tutorial. Um, and now we're going to move on to step seven, configuring the keyboard response item. So I click on it. And here we actually don't need to do much, but just let's just take a look at uh, the options. So we have a correct response field, it's empty, and it says also here in this information thing that we need to leave it empty to use the variable correct response. In other words, we have defined correct response here, and uh, unless indicated otherwise, that's what OpenSesame is going to use to determine whether a response was correct or not. So that's fine, we leave this empty. Then we have the allowed responses field, and there we can put a list, comma, a semicolon separated list of all the responses that should be accepted, right? That, so all the responses that cause the keyword response to collect a response. So what our participants can type a Z or they can type an M, right? Other things should be ignored. If they accidentally type the, the T or whatever, we should just ignore it. The escape key will also always be accepted because it pauses the experiment. Right, but so what the what is actually allowed is the Z, the M, and the escape key. Then we have a timeout. And the timeout value is just the maximum response time, and if the participant hasn't responded within that time, the experiment just moves on. And OpenSesame pretends as though there was a non-response, so the response will be coded as a non with a capital N, so the non of nothing. Here I think 2000 is a good timeout value because I think within two seconds, the participant should be able to respond uh, to this in this task. And in general, I think having a timeout value makes a lot of sense because it kind of forces the participant to, to, to stay, stay tuned in the experiment, right? So it's a, it's, it's a good thing to do that. And then we have the flush pending key presses box. 
that basically means that we start from scratch uh, and we don't take into account older keys, right? It would be possible, for example, if the, that the participant already pressed a few keys while the fixation dot was on the screen. We don't really want to use those keys, so we, you tick this and you throw them away. So we basically flush all the key, keys that were still hanging. Now that's it. That was uh, what we needed to do for the keyboard response. So we're moving on to step eight, in which we're going to co configure the sampler, the incorrect sound item. Again, a pretty simple, uh, simple step. So uh, the only thing that we really need to do is browse and select incorrect.ogg. So OGG is a kind of sound format, right? It says we accept files in OGG or WAV formats. Let's take a look at what we, cannot, what we can specify. We can change the volume if we want. Right now it's one, so we just leave the volume as it is. Panning, so whether it's to the left or the right, we don't want that. The pitch, how fast we should play back the sound file. One is just the original pitch. Stop after, so we can, if we put this at 100 milliseconds, we would cut the, the sound playback after 100 milliseconds. Fade in, if we want to gradually fade in the sound. And a duration. Again, if we put here a duration of zero milliseconds, that would actually not mean that the sound is played for only zero milliseconds. It would mean that the sound keeps playing in the background, but Open Sesame moves on immediately, right? So it's, it's more it's kind of a pause, a pause duration rather than a duration of the, of the sound file itself. But we cannot leave all those things as they are. We just select incorrect.ogg, which is the end of step eight. Then we move on to step nine, which is kind of a dummy step because we don't really need to do anything, but because it's important, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, in step nine, we're going to configure the variable logger. Now, uh, the variable logger writes data to file. It writes the variables to file. Right now you see it says log all variables recommended. What this means is basically, if you click on here, the variable inspector, you will see that Open Sesame has a list of variables that it knows exist, right? It has a list of uh, a very long list of all kinds of variables that, that it introspects and has detected. All those variables will be written to the log file. Um, that can lead to, I think that's the safe thing to do because you can throw all the stuff out that you're not interested in, but it leads to quite long log file or quite wide log files, I should say, with a lot of columns. If you want to select only a few variables, what you can do is disable this. And then, for example, we would say, okay, I want to have the gaze queue. Uh, I want to have the target position. I want to have the response and also the response time, right? So those are essentially the things that we really need. What, the direction of the gaze, the position of the par target, the response and the response time. Oh, and also the identity of the target, of course, right? Otherwise we cannot determine whether it was uh, correct or not. Um, so that would be fine in principle. Um, so if you prefer your log files clean, you could do that. But I think in general, the safe thing is to do to do is just log everything. And then during the analysis, you can always clean up your data files a little bit, right? So I, that would be my recommendation. But that's what the, the, what the variable logger does. Uh, which brings us to the to step 10, in which we're going to draw the feedback item. All right, so here, after every block, we have feedback. And this is the feedback item. We, and we're going to use this feedback item to give participants some feedback on their accuracy and average response times during the whole block. Right, so we also have some feedback on every trial, namely a sound if the participant makes an error. But the real feedback comes after every block of trials. Now the feedback, feedback item looks more or less like the like like the sketch pad. The only difference, and you can look more you look looked it up in the documentation. The only difference is that the feedback item is not prepared in advance, which which allows you to kind of uh, fill its content uh, with things that depend on what happened just before. If you see what uh, if you understand what I mean, like the sketch pads are prepared in advance, which means that you cannot have their content depend on what happened. For example, you cannot have the content of a sketchpad depend on what happens during a trial. A feedback item, because they've already been prepared before the trial. Feedback items are not prepared in advance, which means that we can here depend, have the content of the feedback item depend on what the participant did during the block loop. It also means that they're a bit slower, right? So I wouldn't use feedback items for time critical displays, 
but just for things that are not time critical, like presenting feedback. So let's say that we uh, say end of block. Uh, your average response time was average RT milliseconds, your average response time. Your accuracy was ec percent. Press any key to continue. Okay. Up. Now, um, so you see again that I here use these square brackets, right? So indicating that average RT is a the name of a variable and that ec is also the name of a variable. Ec and average RT are these standard variables that Open Sesame keeps track of automatically. Uh, so that you can, so that it becomes very easy to give feedback to the participants, right? So average RT is just an average reaction time in milliseconds, and ACK is the accuracy in percent. So not proportion, but percent. Okay, that's essentially it. Um, we leave the duration here at key press because we want to leave this this display on the on, visible for as long as the participant uh, uh, wants to take a break, for example. Okay, now. Then we get to step 11, in which we're going to specify the length of the practice phase and the experimental phase. So uh, let's fold this in. Let's go to the practice loop. Here you see that um, each cycle is repeated once and we have only one, one row. This means that block sequence is called only once. In other words, the practice loop consists of only one block. Um, say that we want to have the practice loop consist of two blocks, we could do it like this. We could say, okay, repeat twice. And then you will see the summary changes. Block sequence will be called twice in random order. The number of rows is one, all rows occur twice. Uh, what is also a good idea to do is to add a variable called practice and put it to yes. This doesn't really do anything in the experiment, but it makes it easy to exclude all the practice trials during the, during the analysis, right? So what, right now it means we define during the practice loop a variable called practice that has the value yes, and we run two practice blocks. I actually think that two practice blocks is a bit much, so just let, let's put it back to one. Okay, and for the experimental loop, the same. Uh, so let, we again add a practice variable, this time putting it to no, right? So that we can distinguish the practice trials from the experimental trials. And then we can, for example, put the repeat value to eight, that would mean that we have eight uh, blocks of trials in the, uh, in the experimental uh, sequence, which is, uh, seems fine. Eight blocks is uh, not that bad. We can also go to the block loop and here kind of at this level, the same thing applies. So we have eight kinds of trials, right? We have eight, eight rows, eight unique types of trials, and they're each executed once, meaning that each block consists of eight trials. I think eight trials is a bit short for a block. So we can put this repeat value, say, to, to three. And then you see here, trial sequence will be called 24 times in random order. The number of rows is eight, because we have eight things here. All rows occur three times, because we have a repeat value of three. Right, so then we have a block length of 24. Meaning that, for example, the practice loop, of not for, for example, but meaning that the practice loop is one block of 24 trials, and the experimental loop is eight block blocks of 24 trials is uh, 100 and eh, how much is that? Well, doesn't matter. This actually is the debug window, uh, but no matter. Uh, okay, so now we've done that. The only thing that actually still needs to be done, I think, in step 12 is to give to add some instructions and messages to the participants. So click on the instruction screen. Um, and what we do here is we have a title of this form. So it's just a kind of a text form and this title will be instructions. The button text is I understand, add exclamation mark. And then we just add some instruction text here. Now, good instructions are really an, an art, right? Because if you if you write a whole essay, then participants are never going to read it. If you make it too short, then participants are not going to understand. So you really need to kind of have a very concise and very good way to explain your instructions. 
Ideally, of course, you are actually there in the room as an experimenter when the participant does it, but sometimes you are not, and then you really have to rely on, uh, on clear instructions. So say uh, you will see the letter, you will see an H, an F or an H. Uh, if you see an F, press the Z key. If you see an H, press the M key. Be as fast and accurate as possible. Okay, so that is in, in itself a clear instruction, but I think there's still a good chance of participants not understanding it. If I would make a real experiment like this, I would probably add a few example slides in the, in the instruction phase so that you give some visual, like for example, you show a trial on which there is an F and you tell them, okay, here, in this case, you press the Z key and you show them a trial in which there is an H and you tell them, okay, in this case, you press the M key, right? So you give some, them some visual ex examples. Those tend to stick better in the minds of the participants. But this is okay, this is fine. Huh? End of practice. Uh, so that's another, so I click here, end of practice. We just tell the participant, end of practice. The practice phase is over. Uh, click, uh, click on OK to start the actual experiment. And now I, I realized that I did something awkward. Uh, no, no, OK, no, that's fine. I thought I said I said press any key to continue here, but uh, because they have to click on a button, not press any key. OK. And then at the very end of the experiment, we give them another message. We say, end of experiment. The experiment is finished. Uh, click on OK to exit. OK, now that's, that's it in principle. That's all we needed to do. Um, so let's give the experiment a test run. Now, it, it is very rare for an experiment to work perfectly on the first go. Huh? So we might run into some uh, some trouble, but let's try it. So I'll put the experimental loop back to one and I will actually put the block loop repeat value also to, to a half even so that we skip half the trials. The reason that I do that is simply because so that it doesn't make take so, so, so doesn't take so long uh, to show you. Huh? Okay, now a very cool trick of Open Sesame is that you can show the debug window here, um, and uh, the debug, oh sorry, that's not the debug window, the variable inspector. And the variable inspector will show you while the experiment is running uh, what, uh, what the values of all these variables are. And that, uh, and that can be very useful for debugging. You will see how that works here. Now, how do I run the experiment? Well, I have three ways to run the experiment here. Full screen, which is what you would do if you're actually testing a participant. Uh, run in a window, but still ask for a log file and a subject number, and the quick run. And the quick run is what we're going to do right now. It will use, I think, participant number 999 and some default log file name, just for testing. Click on it, then we pray. Up. There we go, you get the instructions. You will see an F or an H. If you see an F, press the Z key. If you see an H, press the M key. Be as fast as accurate as possible. Mm, font size is a bit big, huh? so we get some visual artifacts. It's not, not a big deal. Okay, there we go. So I see the F, I press Z. Now, if you look on the right side of the screen, you see actually that, uh, oh, M. You see what's going on, huh? you see all the values of the gaze cue, the correct response, etc. Um, and I get feedback. It says end of block. Your average response time was uh, well, a bit more than a second, so it's quite slow. Your accuracy was 100%. I'll also make a mistake, but I'm not sure if you can will be able to hear the sampler in the screencast. But maybe let's take a look. So now we get the experimental phase. I make a mistake. You heard it, heard it maybe through in the background. Uh, now I do it correctly, 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 right? So I have 75% accuracy because I made one mistake out of four. Okay, then the experiment is finished. I press any key to continue. Experiment is finished. Click OK to exit. 
Oké, okay. and now uh, Open Sesame tells us that the experiment finished successfully. And it also says, okay, you can open the log file if you want. So let's do that so that you have some idea of what the log file looks like. Right, you also here in the variable inspector, you will be able to see kind of see the status of your experiment as it ended. So you can kind of see, okay, it ended with 75% accuracy, blah, 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 a whole bunch of stuff, the date time, the experiment path, what, uh, what have you. The, that we're using Open Sesame 3.1.6 for this particular uh, screencast. Okay, but let's open the log file up in LibreOffice, another free program. And you see that it recognizes immediately what that we're dealing with a comma separated value. So actually we can disable all of this. So the it opens it just fine now, but the real the real encoding is Unicode UTF-8 comma separated uh, quoted field as text. It doesn't change anything for this particular uh, for this particular log file. But for example, if you notice that characters are encoded seem look funny, it means that you have not chosen the correct character set, which should be UTF-8. Okay, let's take a look. And there we go. Now that's our our data file, right? So we have uh, we have uh, eight trials, two through nine, which makes sense because we have two blocks of four trials. One mistake that I made here. You also see now that we have a lot of columns, right? And uh, that is, as I said, because we have chosen to log all possible variables that Open Sesame has. That is not a big deal. You can just throw the columns away that you're not interested in. And that is still safer than uh, selecting a few columns yourself and then noticing after the fact that you forgot to log something important. Or maybe after the fact you, you thought like, okay, I wanna you know, have some more information, but I didn't log it or whatever, right? So uh, now with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. That was the Open Sesame video tutorial. Um, and I think you have a lot of tools in your toolbox now to start uh, working on your own uh, experiment. Thank you much for your, very much for your attention.